Um, you've joined the session entitled The Prosecution of Financial Crimes Against the Elderly. So if that's not the session you wanted to be in, uh, you're going to need to look for one of the other sessions. Um, I think we're ready to begin, uh, but before I introduce the speakers, I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping matters to keep things running more smoothly for you today. Um, we would ask that you keep your speakers muted and your video off throughout the presentation. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, and you can always use the chat box up in your right-hand corner uh, to submit any questions that you might have, and I will keep an eye on that. Um, any of the PowerPoints that are going to be used today will be made available uh, through the Community College's webpage. And in addition, each session will be recorded, and that's going to be made available on the college's YouTube page. Uh, should take about a week or two following our symposium. And then lastly, uh, we will need your evaluations back, completed at the end of today, in order for you to get your continuing ed credits, which I know you all want. Uh, so this is also, you can find this information at the bottom of the event email that was sent out. So let's move along. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. First, we have uh, Mr. Alan Garabedian. You're there. Give us a wave. There we go. Mr. Garabedian joined Bucks County District Attorney's Office as an, assist an assistant DA in 2010. He currently serves as Deputy District Attorney uh, assigned to the Economic Crimes and Arson, Di Arson Division, where he specializes in prosecuting high-value thefts, forgery, embezzlement, identity theft, and home improvement fraud. Mr. Garabedian serves as Chief of Elder Abuse Protections, Prosecutions, I'm sorry, and is the office's liaison to the Bucks County Elder Abuse Task Force and the Pennsylvania State Police Gaming Enforcement Office at Parks Casino. He reached his undergraduate degree from, received his undergraduate degree from St. Joseph's University and his law degree from Drexel University School of Law. <laughs> Joining him is Detective Eric Landamia, who serves as the Bucks County's, there we go, Bucks County's District Attorney's Office, where he has been since 2013. And he also assists with financial crimes and mobile device forensics. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us today, and I'll monitor the chat for questions. All right. Thank you, Karen. If you get any questions while we're speaking, just feel free to interrupt us and let us know. We're happy to take questions. Um, I just want to thank you all for uh, for joining our presentation today. Uh, we're certainly happy to, to speak with you all, even if it's over um, blue jeans and not in person, um, but we're happy that we could do it. Um, when we first organized, um, uh, or, or said we were going to speak here. Eric and I said we would do it together, um, and uh, that was pre-COVID, and now we're together. So we're going to try to keep our masks on um, and uh, and speak to you. Hopefully you can hear us. I figure if they, uh, they're they asking my uh, my kindergartner to wear a mask and speak in school, Eric and I can can uh, can try to do it as well. So um, again, thank you. Thank you for joining our uh, talk today. Um, Eric and I are... Um, both work for the district attorney's office, he in the detective division, and I as a prosecutor. We, uh, for majority of our cases, handle uh, what's called white collar crime. Um, Eric does the investigations, and I take it take it over from Eric once once he does the investigation and the, and the case is charged. Um, these white collar crimes are the ones we're going to be talking about today. Unfortunately, many of um, the victims in these types of cases are are. Uh, Adults, um, and we're going to hopefully talk about why that is, and uh, and give you some case examples so that you can know kind of what to look for, and um, hopefully either how to how to prevent it or how to stop it. So, um, I just want to kind of go over uh, essentially what the Bucks County Crimes Against Older Adults Task Force is and what it does. So, so the older um, older adults task force um, pre-COVID, we would meet once a month. Uh, it's members um, of the um, law enforcement community as well as the courts and the agencies serving our our elderly individuals. Um, I'm the I'm the representative from the, the Bucks County District Attorney's Office. Um, 
present at these meetings uh, is um, generally Sandy from Nova, who deals with a lot of the elderly um, victims that we have. Uh, Nova is a great organization for when we have um, criminal charges and um, the victims need uh, assistance in either getting to court or preparing for court or um, dealing with kind of the emotional trauma that goes on from being a victim. They arrange for counseling and and they are somebody just to have to talk to because as a prosecutor, we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of cases and you know it's not always easy to get a hold of us, but if the if the victim needs somebody to talk to or to be there with them, uh, Nova is a great organization and they have great people working for them that uh, assist us in uh, in in helping the victims of crime. So again, um, the area agency on aging is present. Uh, the good thing about these meetings is that if they see something in um, in their jobs or in their work when they're assisting. Um, people who are in need of services, they can bring this to our attention at these meetings. Um, and, you know, I can turn it over to Eric um, and I can also direct it kind of the local police department where we can uh, follow up with uh, a criminal investigation. Then Mike Bannon from Consumer Protection um, is also a good resource. A lot of um, crimes against elderly individuals and older adults. Um, involve some sort of consumer aspect um, and generally some people know to call the police departments other people will call consumer protection and consumer protection can then relay those uh, complaints to us and we can follow up for investigations um, our bucks county register of wills clerk of the orphans court uh, members of the u.s attorney's office uh, for the eastern district of pennsylvania are also present as well as the Senior Law Center, which is another great resource for seniors. Um, they um, won't necessarily be handling the criminal aspect, but um, they generally help uh, seniors in, um, I guess, civil um, aspects when they need help in, in civil court. And also we have a member from the banking community. It was called Monument Bank. I think now it's CNN Bank, um, but, it, but in any event, um, it is nice to have someone from the banking community uh, there present to kind of show us and tell us what's going on uh, on their area because because um, as you're going to see a lot of financial crimes um, are done through banks and we do work a lot with um, the banking sector in prosecuting these cases so again it is nice to have uh, that representative from the banking industry as well okay so one more time. All right, so I'm gonna, Eric, I'm going to pose you a question. What what does the I guess law in Pennsylvania consider uh, an elderly um, elderly individual for purposes of some sort of increased grading or increased punishment when you commit a crime against them? Uh, it's 60 years of age, and that is good for multiple sections, both in the home improvement contractor fraud section, uh, theft by deception, identity theft, and I believe there's at least one other uh, crimes code violation where a victim over 60 uh, results in an enhanced grading on the offense charge. Now, when I when I first started in prosecution, I've been in white collar crime the entire time. And when I heard the age of 60 years of age, to me that did not seem like um, an elderly individual. I mean, I have I have parents who are or older than 60. I know many of us know individuals who are older than 60 years of age, and they are perfectly healthy and capable of dealing with their financial situation, and are just as sharp over the age of 60 as they are at as they were at 20. Uh, so it was um, when I first heard that I, it didn't it didn't seem right to me. Um, so, as I found out through um, the years that we have been prosecuting these types of cases, it, it 60 does make sense. Um, and there have been studies that will even show that 
it happens even before uh, 60 years of age. And what I'm talking about is some sort of um, financial decline in our elderly residents. In uh, 2009, there was a Brookings Institution paper uh, which said that the peak age for handling money is about 53 years old. And, Recording is on. And they described it as uh, kind of a U-shaped curve where you go to handle your phone. Uh, sorry, we're getting a little feedback there. The ability to handle your finances usually peaks and, and rises as you get older, peaks at 53, and then starts to decline after 53. Again, that's below the 60 years of age that the, that the criminal law um, contemplates, but uh, it's certainly, it's certainly um, uh, younger of an age than most people would expect. Again, that was followed up at, most recently in 2019. There was a Duke uh, Health study, basically uh, acknowledging the same thing and kind of went into and went into more of the science of why that happens. Um, and just to read from the PowerPoint, um, financial skills start slipping for those with dementia earlier than many believe, and that declining money management skills correlate with rising levels of a protein called beta amyloid in the brain. Uh, clumps or plaques of amyloid are a hallmark indicator of Alzheimer's disease, although they can be present without cognitive impairment. Essentially, that's what, the, what that is saying is these individuals may not be showing um, signs of dementia, memory loss, um, um, the other signs that you would see in your, in your practice of, of, of what you would know as, as dementia. Kind of the precursors, and it's based on these beta amyloids. So you may look at uh, one of your residents or one of your parents or, or elderly neighbors and think that they seem fine, um, but uh, based on the, um, the findings of Duke, um, their, their financial abilities may be in decline uh, before their uh, cognitive abilities. The patient has no balance. Uh, Sorry, if you have your if you if you have your mic on, can we just ask you to to um, to mute it just because it's causing a little problem uh, feedback on this end. So this was uh, again uh, coined as age-associated financial vulnerability. Again, it's the same uh, type of uh, concept that I've been previously talking about with the Brooklyn, Brookings Institute and Duke Health. Um, I recently heard a um, a podcast for, um, it was National Elder Abuse uh, Week, and this was maybe last year. Um, one of the local uh, radio stations had did a podcast on it, and they had explored this area um, in depth, and, you know, they had it on an individual who um, was, was part of one of these uh, elder scams where it was, um, I think it was a romance scam, and the, the individual was actually a nurse. Uh, she was in her 50s. Um, she had was fine living on her own, conducting her normal uh, business. And um, she ended up sending uh, $200,000 worth of um, gift cards to an individual she thought she was romantically involved in, and that being um, some individual overseas uh, who, who got away with her essentially life savings and more because she started to take out uh, loans to, to make these payments. So there was no, no signs of um, mental decline or cognitive decline in this individual. She was in her 50s, she seemed relatively healthy, and yet she was essentially duped um, in a situation where many of us would see this as clearly a fraud, um, but, um, but for some reason she could not uh, process that. So. All right, so who are, who are some of the individuals who are committing these types of crime against our older adults? Uh, I think in a lot of the cases, Eric, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's going to be a family member, right? It's, uh, it's typically a family member and or uh, a power of attorney, I think is what we were seeing the most of. When okay. it comes to these type of elder exploitation through embezzlement cases as opposed to the consumer-based. Uh, it's usually family or a POA. Okay. 
Um, and family, we're, we're generally seeing it's the adult children of these individuals? Almost exclusively. Okay, and in these situations, what they'll do is they'll obtain um, power of attorney um, and then use that power of attorney to kind of just liquidate the funds. Yes, they uh, typically what we've been seeing, they you don't you're not obligated to file a power of attorney with the county, although you can. Uh, so what we'll see a lot is somebody will download a generic power of attorney form, craft it to their own needs, maybe take out some any uh, fiduciary responsibility language, and then they will um, have that person sign it. And we don't even know. We can. It's hard to prove if that person even knew what they were signing at the time they signed it. Um, and then they use that as their golden ticket to empty the bank account. So, and, and while we think uh, most of the time it's it's family or children of the individuals, it's not always family, correct? That's correct. All right. So we're going to show you a couple of examples of, of people other than family uh, who are in these older adults' lives who um, who take advantage of them. So it's going to be friends. Uh, one of the examples we have is uh, as a neighbor who, who lived next to one of these individuals, got that power of attorney, and then started liquidating um, the elder adults' uh, funds. Uh, nurses. Um, one, of the th one of the areas that we see a lot of nurses getting caught up in crime is in the, uh, I don't know what the correct term is, but the, the, the in-home care setting where we have elder adults still living in their homes, but require some sort of care that um, that needs nurses to go out to their uh, homes uh, on a regular basis. So uh, a lot of times we're seeing that there are multiple multiple nurses going inside, of, inside and out of the home. Uh, it's not maybe just one nurse that's doing it. Um, they're able to exploit this. So if funds are missing, it's not necessarily uh, you don't necessarily know exactly who it is or who 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 did what. Um, generally, in these types of cases that we're seeing, the nurses will go in the house. They'll take the credit cards uh, or bank account information of these elderly adults, and then they'll use the credit cards to purchase goods. Um, and um, and we're not and the elder adult isn't necessarily sure who the one is 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 spending um, the money. So. That's, that's kind of where we see uh, nurses involved. Um, not necessarily financially, um, I guess, associated, but we have seen on several occasions uh, nurses involved with um, taking prescriptions uh, from older adults. This is mostly in the, um, the care facilities. Um, thankfully, that the residents don't necessarily suffer because of the medication, of the theft of the medication, because the home is still providing it. But there's some sort of, uh, I guess, shenanigans going on where the nurses are starting to take the the prescriptions of um, of the older adults, uh, essentially for their own use, that they have some sort of uh, op opioid addiction or some other drug or alcohol addiction uh, that is leading to that. To that. So, uh, as I said, neighbors, caregivers. And one of the other ones that's shocking is uh, professionals. Um, we have seen uh, lawyers, we have seen accountants. Um, one of the ones we're going to be talking about later on in the presentation is an accountant who got into um, a nursing home in uh, Middletown, had signed up several clients to work as their an accountant, was working as an accountant for another individual in a home in Delaware County, and essentially liquidated those individuals as well. All right, All right so why why are, are older adults being targeted by individuals um, to commit crimes? Well, I, the main reason we see in financial crimes is just greed. Um, our older adults have uh, had a lifetime of work. Many of them have some sort of pension or social security benefit that is coming in every month and it's essentially a steady stream of income for these uh for these criminals so number one is just it's just plain old greed um number two we see a drug addiction playing uh playing a part um we have experienced uh, as many of you know the heroin heroin and 
opioid uh, epidemic. Um, when you're on those types of drugs, it leads you to do a lot of bad things, including stealing from uh, our most vulnerable residents. So again, not only just stealing the actual pills, as I previously discussed, but also stealing money to to feed that habit, to pay for that, you know, that hundred dollar a day, two hundred dollar a day heroin habit uh, that those individuals have. Uh, number three. Um, I don't know whether this is particular to this area um, or whether it's happening um, nationwide, but one of the one of the um, reasons you're going to see in the next couple of examples that Eric and I have is is a gambling addiction. Uh, we in Bucks County are essentially surrounded by by casinos. We have parks in Ben Salem, which I think is one of the excuse me um, probably has the most revenue out of any of the uh, the casinos uh, in Bucks County and in sp specifically Pennsylvania. Uh, we have Sugar House, a short drive to Philly, um, Atlantic City, which is a what hour, hour and a half drive, Harris in Chester, Sands in Bethlehem. Um, addiction, not only drug addiction, but gambling addiction um, is another theme that you're going to see in the, these theft cases that, that we're going to show you. And we're talking about large amounts of money, right, Eric? When we got the uh, the case we did together, you'll see uh, Jean Swain. She was an accountant. When we got her records in from Parks, the numbers were staggering. And and the thing is about about gambling, even in an age of COVID, um, you could still gamble now. You can gamble from your phone. You can do sports wagering. We have sports back, so it's not like um, we're going to see a decline uh, in theft because of a gambling addiction. I think that in the next uh, the next year we're going to see an increase because people are still at home. They can't necessarily go to the casino, um, but they can just do it essentially from their phone or computer. And trying to prove it will be a lot harder because you can sometimes anonymize yourself online or mm -hmm. through applications. Right. And so, and, and the last reason um, is that these individuals are just um, just an easy target for criminals. Um, most of our, our older residents are, are trusting. Um, they don't necessarily have the cynicism that uh, some of us younger folks do. Um, they uh, may be suffering some sort of physical or, or mental ailments that prevent them from understanding what's going on or preventing it. And also, you know, once, once they figure out what has, what has happened to them, um, they, there's some sort of humiliation aspect where they, they they want it to stop, but they don't necessarily want to go to the police or have anything done hap happen to these defendants because they're somehow humiliated by, by the fact that they let this happen to them. So. All right. So I wanted to add uh, a slide about elder abuse and, and kind of where I think um, COVID-19 is taking us and, and the effects that it's going to have. So COVID-19 is, is basically giving us less face-to-face -face contact with, uh, with the older adults by not only family members, but by the professionals, you men and women who are, who are dealing with them on a regular basis. Um, and I think we saw some studies about, um, about child abuse in the age of COVID where prosecutors offices and um, the uh, child hotline are getting less reports because teachers and doctors are having less interaction with these individuals. It's not that the incidents of child abuse are going down, it's that we're just not catching it. And I think that's what we're gonna, have, we're gonna see happening to our elderly individuals um, based on um, the, um, the effects of um, the lockdowns for COVID-19. So again, this is a very, um, isolating situation, um, not only for the non-elderly, but especially for the elderly who can't see their family, who are, you know, maybe in a room and are afraid to go out. Um, this creates an opportunity for someone to kind of sneak in there and fill the void um, that is missing by their family members or the, the, the professionals. So um, we may see defendants sneaking into people's lives um, through that isolation. Um, 
reduce services again based on based on the restrictions and people trying to reduce face-to-face -face conduct another big thing is that there's that inability to kind of shop and or bank on their own so they may want somebody else to do it for them um, and basically turning over the keys to their bank account um, and that person then going wild with with not spending that money on the elderly individual but by spending it on themselves again uh, as far as the banking uh, sector a lot of times um, you know the banks the tellers will have a relationship with these individuals um, these are people that still go into the bank and do their banking at the teller and um, you know they they have the ability to speak with them and maybe tell them something isn't right with this maybe you shouldn't be withdrawing this money to send to the the prince overseas and with that reduced interaction there's there's we're losing that ability to to warn them and prevent the crime so again this is all i think we're going to see an increase in these types of thefts against the elderly because of COVID-19. And I believe there's also been an uptick in the uh, the romance scams and those online gift cards and then transfers of finances due to the uh, the romance scams. We've had a couple uh, county level our our actual County of Bucks Treasurer's account was counterfeited and uh, those checks were deposited into the accounts of, of a senior who then transmitted them overseas uh, unknowingly. Uh, the uh, kind of a check from our own treasury was uh, mailed to him. Right. And again, just lastly, um, we're talking about a decrease in mental health, um, and I'm not just talking about the utterly individuals based on that isolation, but it's also in these potential defendants. Um, if they are isolated, if they are um, having less face-to-face -face interaction, and which is increasing their um, their mental health issues. Again, that leads to um, drug abuse. It leads to uh, gambling. If you already had those issues, it makes them worse, and therefore um, they may be more uh, incentivized or uh, more willing to commit these types of crimes against uh, our elderly uh, Bucks County residents. So, what crimes are we talking about when we're talking about financial crimes um, against the elderly? Basically, it's theft. Um, there's different um, there's different titles uh, and subsections of theft in the Pennsylvania Crimes Code: theft by unlawful taking, theft by deception, theft by failure to make required disposition of funds. It's essentially all the same same type of stuff. It's taking money from somebody that's not yours, and you didn't have permission permission to do it. Um, and those three different sections just say it in a different way. Uh, forgery. Um, we'll generally see this. Um, in cases where they are, they're using the elderly individual's credit card and they need to sign for something and they'll sign for, um, they'll sign as the elderly individual and then pass that receipt checks. over. Um, again, checks, as Eric reminds me, we'll see a lot of forged checks coming out of the elderly individual's uh, bank accounts um, for large sums, either large sums to uh, pay their credit cards or debit, not debit cards, but credit cards or uh, Amazon accounts or PayPal, that sort of stuff. Uh, or we will see it just made out the cash and then them cashing the checks and taking the money. Access device fraud is uh, essentially credit card fraud, taking that individual's credit card from their residence uh, and using it past them past the permission that they were given to use that card if they were given permission at all identity theft is kind of the same thing uh, using that individual's name date of birth social security number um, other identifying information to uh, to further that unlawful purpose of taking money from them and lastly, um, home improvement fraud. We do see um, a lot of individuals, uh, elderly residents, being taken advantage of by these um, be, by these contractors. Who we call them contractors. They're not really contractors. They're thieves. They're just kind of masquerading as contractors. They will, you know, basically go into these these people's homes and do some demo. And by the time they're asking you for more money your house is destroyed and you don't know what to do. So um, those are kind of generally the crimes that we, we are charging 
when we have a crime against a uh, older adult. These are the, the sentences we're, we're going to be seeing. Um, these are basically the guidelines that the Crimes Code lays out. Um, the misdemeanor of the third degree is kind of the lowest offense that we'll see in a theft case. The felony F1 is the felony of the first degree. That is the highest charge that you are going to see. The grading of the charges basically depends on the amount of the theft. So the higher the theft, the higher the grading. And correlated with that is the penalty. So these um, terms of imprisonment and the maximum fines that you're seeing on there, those are the maximums. Generally, we're not seeing somebody get uh, imprisoned in Pennsylvania on an F1 for 20 years. In Pennsylvania, they have to give a minimum and a maximum. So the maximum can be only 20 years. So you can have um, 10 to 20 or 5 to 20 or 3 to 20. Um, but that's the maximum. And again, a judge doesn't have to do that. It's just what the guidelines um, give as the maximum a judge can do. Same with the fine. Um, in elder abuse cases, we, we're not really arguing for fines because, not because we don't think that they deserve it, but because there's large amounts of restitution and we'd rather have any money that the defendants are paying back if they're convicted going to pay back the restitution as opposed to fines to this to the state. So. Eric, right. this is Damon from the college. We're actually not seeing your presentation. We're seeing just a blue screen there. Maybe we could get you guys to stop the share and restart it. I'm not sure when that happened because at some point I know I saw your slides. Okay. Now we see them. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So Eric and I are now going to talk about some of the cases uh, that we've seen in Bucks County and um, kind of give you the fact pattern so you can kind of see where things went wrong. If we can figure out how to do our PowerPoint. <laughs> Hopefully you can all, all see this. Um, all right, so this is Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Derek Reynolds and Commonwealth versus David Wenhold. These two were acting together. Um, I don't know. I mean, it seems like um, these, I don't want to stereotype, but when I, when I think about who would be perpetrating crimes against um, the utterly individuals, it would be Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Wenhold, just because they didn't necessarily have... Um, a strong relationship to these these um, these elderly victims. They kind of were passing through their lives. Were a friend of a of a grandson. So um, this is kind of who I generally would picture um, if I if I didn't have um, the experience um, that I do prosecuting these cases. So um, you go next slide. All right, so this, uh, these crimes occurred in Hilltown Township between 2016 and 2017. Uh, the victims in this case were 89 and 93-year-old uh, husband and wife who were, who were living independently. Um, we kind of stumbled upon this because uh, one of the detectives or the detective who was investigating the case was also a member of um, the church that these two individuals belonged to, and he kind of was able to communicate with them in passing, and we were able to discover, you know, this this large theft perpetrated among them. They, even though they were 89 or 93 years old, they had, um, you know, they're I think as about as um, as cognitive aware as you can be, and 89 or 93 years old, it, they weren't suffering from any severe, um, you know, mental health decline, um, and they they. In my interactions with them, they seem to be individuals who understand their finances, understand the money coming in and the money going out. Um, and the female victim who was was paying these individuals this money was keeping a detailed list of how much how much money she was giving out. Um, and we were able to have that list for when these two were ultimately convicted to determine 
you know, how much restitution they were going to be ordered to pay back. So essentially what happens is um, Derek, who is the individual on the left, calls the police on Dave when he starts to feel the heat. Um, the victims were Mr. Wenholds' ex-girlfriends, uncle and aunt. So that's kind of the, the, the tangential relationship between the two. Um, he was getting between $300 and $400 a day. Um, and this was cash that the female victim was withdrawing from the bank. He would give various reasons why he needed the money. It was he needed money for a tow. He needed money to be bailed out of jail. He needed money for his medications because he got seizures and he didn't have insurance. Um, for doctor's bills, for parking fines. So he essentially was giving um, the, the female victim any excuse um, he could to keep withdrawing these $300 and $400 a day from her. Um, and you, you may be asking, why was this, why was this man and woman just giving him the money for this? This does sound like suspicious, $300 or $400 a day for all this. But again, I think it goes back to that, what we talked about previously in that, you know, they may not be experiencing any sort of, um, cognitive decline, but the, uh, the financial decline, uh, has started. So she would make withdrawals of the money every day from the bank um, and drop it off at his house in his mailbox. Um, he told them he had the money to pay them back, um, but he didn't have access to it. This is a common scheme that we see kind of in those, ro those romance scams or um, like the email scams where people saying, I need access to my money. If you just send me this much, I can unlock it and I'll be able to, to pay you your money back sometimes with interest. So this, that's kind of like a common... Uh, theme or scam uh, we'll see th throughout these. Um, the, the male victim tries to stop his wife from giving the money, uh, but she believes that if she were to do that, uh, Dave and Derek would, would get mad and not pay them back. Um, the bank in this case did try to intervene. Um, however, the female victim was scared and, and resisted. So she was going to the bank, the teller was seeing this, was trying to get her to realize what was going on and that this was a scam or they were being um, victimized. And she just was, was, was scared and I think probably humiliated about what had happened to them and just thought if she kept paying it, it somehow uh, would get better. Derek told police that he never took any money, but he was just reporting it on Dave. Um, again, once we find out, the uh, law enforcement, Hilltown Townships, talks to the female victim. Originally, she doesn't want to prosecute. Again, going back to the humiliation and the, uh, the, the scaredness of these victims. As the investigation progresses, they find out Derek is getting more money as well. He, he was telling them he needed money for medical procedures and ailments, including diabetes and for prescription medication. And what we eventually find out is that Dave would pick up the money and take the train to the city to buy drugs and specifically heroin. Uh, between October of 2016 and February 2017, uh, Derek had received about $8,560 uh, from the, the husband and wife. Dave Wenhold uh, had received approximately $65,281, uh, which amounted to about $530 a day, which is a large amount when you think about it. I mean, on the screen, it may not, it may just seem like numbers, but $530 a day is a whole lot of money, um, especially for somebody who is in their 90s and is on a fixed income. I was going to have you guess the sentence, but uh, I guess Eric pulled the trigger. Um, so they were sentenced to one to three years in a state correctional institution um, with a consecutive two, two years of probation. Mr. Reynolds uh, had paid his restitution in full. His was, the I guess, like the $8,000 amount. Mr. Wenhold, of course, still owes uh, the balance of that money. Um, and one of the themes that you'll see throughout is that we may successfully prosecute these individuals, we may convict them, um, but 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get the money back. A lot of times, um, the money is gone, the money is spent, and we're not able to get the money back uh, for for the elderly victims. Sometimes we can, and it's great. I mean, we, we do everything we can to try to do it. You all right? Okay, sorry, we're getting a little feedback there. Uh, but other times, we're just not able to, to get the money back. One of the things I want to point out in this case, um, for any members of the, the banking community, we we do work closely with them. Uh, when we're serving warrants, we're working with the bank managers to get a hold of these individuals' financial accounts. Um, Mary Kay Kohler and I, um, Mary Kay does, is, works for our office as a prosecutor. She works in the, um, she, she does elder abuse as well. She does more of the physical um, abuse, and you may have heard her speak uh, last year at the NEF Symposium. We were um, speaking to a House delegate, Pennsylvania House delegation, about um, an elder abuse uh, law that they're working on and trying to get passed. And one of the things that we had suggested and the, the district attorney's office had suggested was kind of eliminating any civil liability that can, that can come to banks or bank tellers who see something wrong and want to disclose um, to prosecutors or to other law enforcement agencies, police departments, the attorney general office, crimes that they are seeing perpetrated by their customers. And um, I think we were kind of met with some resistance from at least one of the members, which I hadn't thought about. But, um, you know, looking at it from a prosecution perspective, we want people to come to us and, t and tell us these things. So, we can stop it before it gets to the amounts of 100 and 200,000, 300,000 dollar thefts. Um, but I think the point that was made was we don't necessarily want to be, um, I, don't, I guess the term like kind of like a nanny state, like making sure that these elderly adults are spending their money the way that Eric or I would be spending our money. Um, and you know, it may seem like a, a, just a no brainer to to have these bank tellers be able to tell us what's going on with these accounts. But on the flip side, I do recognize that, um, you know, elderly individuals, elderly Bucks Countyans are perfectly handle, capable of making decisions for themselves and doing with their money as they see fit if they want to send, you know, their, their nest egg to their relatives or their, um, to other individuals. They're, it's their money. They can, they can do with it as, as they wish. Um, but it's not always like a clear, uh, clear cut answer for these banks on what to do, whether to tell us or not, or whether, whether they think it's an actual crime or not. And here in this case, um, you know, that came into play because the bank teller saw what was going on and tried to stop the individual, but I didn't, didn't necessarily report it to the police. They just, they'd rather have a deal with, deal with the customer and try to get the customer to do it. So. Um, that's one of the things that we're working on. There's no, not a great solution, but uh, it is an issue that may come up um, in in your dealings with the with the elderly uh, individuals. All right. So this is Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Jane Irvin and Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Albert Ferreira. Um, So the victim in this case uh, was out of Ben Salem Township. Uh, this was an 87-year-old victim. Uh, this case was investigated by Steve Clark, who's a Ben Salem detective. I know Steve, uh, Steve, or members of Ben Salem Police Department attend this uh, symposium yearly. So if Steve out, is out there. Uh, good work, Steve, on this. Um, an 87-year-old victim, um, Ms. Irvin, was the daughter and the power of attorney since 2009. Ferreira was her uh, husband, who was a retired Philly uh, police um, police officer. The reason why I point this out is just because, again, it's not necessarily someone who you would expect to be committing these uh, these types of crimes. But um, but as we previously told you, it really could be anybody. In 2010, the victim goes to Oaks, uh, which is a nursing facility. 
In 2012, they, uh, they tried to relocate her to uh, another facility. Um, he needed uh, in-house hospice care. The facility tried to get um, Irvin to do it. Uh, Irvin would not answer the calls. Uh, they were uh, behind on paying the bills and medications. When we get referrals, a lot of times what happens is um, the defendants are not paying the bills at the um, at the facility. So, as 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 you know, these bills start to add up pretty quickly. And when we start to get ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in arrears that are owed, that's when we start to get the calls from the care facilities to the Area Agency on Aging, to the local police department, to our office. Um, and this is kind of um, another one of those situations where the facility was not being paid. Uh, he they were not providing any visits to him. There was no personal care items or clothing. Um, the victim had a, uh, had a substantial amount of money and the facility would having to dress the victim in donated clothing. Um, based on the, um, the the nest egg and the income that this individual had, I don't believe they were eligible for any Medicare or any Medicaid, um, and they just had their their kind of large nest egg. So in 2012 to 2015, the facility uh, tries to get $768 and some change in arrears to the facility, and the facility files suit. At that point, the victim was de declared inca incapacitated. Um, they didn't, um, you know, they, they didn't have the ability to understand what was going on with their finances, and the court declared them incapacitated. And at that point, Elder Care Advocacy Services um, is appointed as the guardian. And once they're appointed as the guardian, they're able to look at some of the financials, and they alert the police. So the police obtained the bank records uh, in Ju between July of 2009 and December of 2015, uh, the victim had uh, $397,000 of income. We, we were able to determine that about 125,000 of that was used for legitimate expenses, for rent, for the condo fees prior to the individual going to Oaks, taxes, and there were some sp sporadic payments to the facility. Uh, but where did the rest of the money go? Eric, you wanna take a guess? Uh, gambling. <laughs> that is that is one. Yes. All right. So here's kind of where let me go back. This is kind of where the money went. Um, checks made out to cash. They're about seventy-two thousand uh, dollars. Withdrawals at the bank twenty-five thousand dollars. Cash deposits uh, or cash from deposits four thousand one hundred fifty dollars. They put a new basement construction, which was um, they claimed was an in-law suite. Um, obviously it was not an in-law suite because their in-law was at Oaks and they were not paying the bills. Um, in spite of them lying about the reason for the, um, the basement construction, they also stiffed the construction company out of $7,000. Parks Casino and ATM withdrawals, uh, there were $61,350.53 withdrawn from the ATMs at Parks Casino, another $22,485. Uh, dollars withdrawn from the casinos in Atlantic City, $2,900 in Las Vegas, another $47,000 in uh, withdrawals at ATMs, of course, bank fees, um, what do they care, it's not their money, um, so they're going to, you know, they're incurring bank fees and overdraft fees, and then using that money for debit card purchases for a total of Two hundred seventy-one thousand three hundred twenty-seven dollars and sixty-seven cents. Now, again, those are just numbers, but I just want you to think about that for a second. How much money that is, and what that amount of money would do in your life. What you could do with that money. How you could live with that money. And this was blown over a matter of a couple of years while. The victim is sitting in Oaks, not paying his bills and being dressed in donated clothing. And I think that would cover the arrears due to Oaks with over $100,000 to spare. Right. All right, so the good thing about having uh, casinos uh, in Bucks County in Pennsylvania is that 
if you're going to commit a crime in, at a casino, it's going to be recorded and it's going to be on camera. So some of the cameras that they have in parks are phenomenal where you can zoom in to see the serial numbers on the bills that the um, that people are sitting down at the gaming tables are using to to pay for their chips. So they're really good, they're really high definition. The other thing is people who um, are gambling at parks or Sugar House or Sands um, and they're gambling large amounts of money, they want to use um, their, their player card. So their player card, um, you know, if you haven't been in a casino before, it, 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 you put it into the machine or you give it to the, um, the, um, the cashier or the, the dealer before you play. And the more you play, the more comps you get, the more, you know, food or um, overnight stays or comp cash that you get. Um, so people are incentivized to use their cards, but that also then leaves a trail of the money that you are playing. So if you haven't already look at, looked at the records, these are the numbers that uh, Mr. Irv, or Ms. Irvin and Ms. Ferreira were spending at the casino, uh, presumably most of it with um, the victim's money. So the coin in represents exactly that, the coin in to uh, either the machines or I, I think I think maybe the, the the table games as well, but definitely for the um, for the slot machines. The coin out is what they're actually pulling out of the machines once they play. So you may win some, you may lose some, but ultimately the difference between that is how much they're they're losing uh, minus any jackpots that they're receiving. So Ms. Irvin lost $131,000 in those five years at, at Parks Casino. Uh, Mr. Ferreira lost another $187,000 at the at the um just on the slots uh when you add that up that's a, that's a roughly what 300 some thousand dollars uh which is uh most of the money that was taken um from from the victim in this case so what's staggering to me is just the number of days per year uh, in 2010 279 out of 365 days that's and then there's three other uh, occurrences where he's in the casino over 200 days out of that year. That's ridiculous. And the thing is, uh, just kind of loop this back to COVID-19, you now have a casino in your in your hand or in, in your, so you're, in, you're essentially in the casino 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. And um, now that people are at home and um, they can't, you know, they can't go out as much, um, I do think we're, we're going to see see this occurring on a regular basis even more than it is now i won't click the sentence okay all right well eric this wasn't your case do you have any idea what the uh, what the sentence might be for the amount of money and not knowing their priors i would hope they would do a state bid but i guess that would largely depend on how much money they were able to provide at the time of sentencing okay so essentially go ahead go ahead so these individuals got 11 and a half to 23 months in the Bucks County Correctional Facility, uh, and they got a concurrent seven years of probation. The restitution, again, was that $271,000 uh, amount. At the time of sentencing, they had paid back about uh, $17,000. Um, and um, I actually got an email or a call, um, I want to say last year, but the uh, the victim has now unfortunately passed away, and the defendants no longer want to pay back any of this money because they essentially were the beneficiaries in the will. So um, that is Ms. Irvin and Ms. Ferrer. All right, next. All right, this is Ms. Swain. Eric, which and you know Ms. Swain, but what is your first reaction when you see Ms. Swain? Uh, she herself appears to be an elder, according to the definition of the law, and uh, she looks like a relatively nice older woman here. She was an accountant uh, who serviced multiple uh, people within a couple of nursing homes. Yeah, she kind of looks like... Um, trustworthy. Trustworthy, correct. She looks trustworthy, um, not like uh, not like someone who would be uh, be taking advantage of people for heroin addiction or some sort of like other addictions or 
drug habit, that sort of thing. So, but you can't always judge a book by its cover. So, this occurred in Bucks and Delaware counties, and this was an investigation um, Detective Londomia did. did. Uh, Swain was a, uh, a CPA in Bucks County, and she... He got, she had a victim who was in one of our nursing homes in the lower end of Bucks County and used that to kind of spread her tentacles to other elderly individuals and then take their money. So I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about it, Eric? I think what was unique for me in this case is only one of the three victims in Bucks County was alive at the time the investigation kicked off. Uh, and it came from family members who were trying to finalize uh, their deceased parents uh, I guess Estates. properties yeah thank you and uh, to try to move them forward and when they started doing it they started getting some pieces of bank records because Mrs. Swain kind of kept everything and uh, they would notice some irregularities and some of them had done their own analyses and thought something was up and they forwarded to us to look into and uh, so we started, uh, two of them, I think this kicked off with the two deceased members, uh, deceased victims, and then we ended up identifying a third living victim at a nursing home that was in Newtown. Okay. So so victim number one uh, was 79 years of age. She uh, dies and her son begins conducting an audit to kind of finalize her estate. Uh, Ms. Swain had been a CPA since 2007, or, or, or her CPA since 2007. Um, and during that time frame, she had written out 53 checks uh, from the victim's account for approximately $30,250. And that was between December of 2008 and September 11th of 2015. Victim number two was 90, year, 90 years old. Uh, she dies and her niece begins to conduct the audit. Um, this was between January 10th of 2009 and September 24th of 2015. There were 68 payments totaling approximately $82,000. Where did some of that money go to? 53 payments were directly to Ms. Swain for about $68,000. There was payments towards uh, Swain's ex-husband's rent uh, towards her son's college tuition, towards Miss Swain's rent, um, towards uh, a rehab facility for her ex-husband. For her ex-husband, there was Pico bills, water bills, Comcast cable. She essentially was just treating these accounts as her own, um, not something you want your uh, certified public accountant doing. No. Um, and again, another thing we we see is that. And this always shocks me that you're stealing money and you're still overdrafting and doing bank fees. It's like it's like you can't help yourself. You just it's there and you just you just keep taking it and keep taking it and you don't you don't think about like well maybe this will if I'm overdrafting or or doing this kind of thing it may alert somebody. Yeah, I think most of us if we approach an ATM that said there's a three dollar surcharge we would turn and walk away. But it's not your money. You don't care. Yeah. So all right, victim number three. Victim number three was 80 years old. Ms. Swain was, was also the power of attorney uh, for this individual. Um, so not just the CPA, but also the power of attorney. Between July of 2009 and February of 2015, there were 60 payments totaling $175,000. Um, 30 payments directly to Ms. Swain uh, for about $140,000. Again, towards rent, towards her office, towards her ex-husband, for her daughter, for Comcast, Horizon, um, for for heating oil, to pay taxes, her federal taxes, her state taxes, her husband's taxes. Um, and remember, this isn't just one. There's there's four other or three other victims. So it's not just this money. It's the money coming in from all the other victims as well. And this victim was a doctor. Um... Yeah, so again, going back to that theme, it's not the, the defendants are not people who you would suspect and the victims are not necessarily people who you would suspect because in these cases, I think one was a doctor, uh, one had been, I think, a college professor, um, one had been, um, been a prof I forget what her profession was, but had been a professional all her life, had, um, 
had done really well with her finances, had 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 saved and had enough to live comfortably into her 80s and 90s. Um, these aren't necessarily the the older adults that you would be thinking of as being able to victimize. But in this case, they were victimized by somebody who they trusted and had a position of power over their finances. I mean, what's sickening on top of that is this was a, as AJ said, a professional. So not only was she stealing from them, but she was billing for her services while stealing from them. So, all right, victim number four. Victim number four was 101 years old. Um, and then it occurred between 2013 and 2014. Again, checks made out to Ms. Swain, daughter's rent, husband's rent, um, health insurance premiums from this account, office supplies for her work, um, and again, basically just liquidating her funds. So um, I didn't want to post their pictures, but um, essentially, essentially, this is this is who we we were looking at. We at the time of sentencing, um, we had presented their pictures to to the judge just so. The judge could have an idea of who these ladies were, what they looked like, kind of put a face to um, to the, the the victim. And this is not them, but I can tell you, the four of them together looked exactly like these like these ladies. Um, and um, that's just that's just who I could think of when I was when I was thinking about these individuals. Not to make light of it, but. Um, but it, it is helpful to put a face to to a victim. So, all right. So where did it all go, Eric? Uh, First of all, what are we looking at? These are more Parks Casino records, uh, just like in the other matters. Um, through a lot of search warrants and legal orders, uh, we finally got to Mrs. Swain's personal bank records, and that's where we started seeing the transactions to Parks. She wasn't using the victims' accounts. Uh, it was solely through hers, and uh, when we saw those parks records, we decided to pull her activity to see if this was a minor, uh, I wouldn't say a minor addiction, but if she was just going there for recreation or if this was some something larger that might explain why she was doing this to these, these uh, poor, old, and some deceased women. And here you're looking at a number just like uh, the Ferrara and Irvin matter where she's gambled $3.49 million into Parks Casino over the course of a five-year period, so seven hundred and fifty thousand a year on average. And again, it's not her money. It's not. All right. So, the so victim number one, victim two, three, four added up three hundred and seventy-eight thousand seven hundred and forty dollars. And this was over the course of what? How many years? Uh, less than ten. Okay. All right. So, sentence-wise. Um, Probably going to be a little higher than the, the other two we talked about. And Ms. Swain? Ms. Swain received a sentence of three to six years in a state correctional facility. Anything with, with a minimum, that, that three number, anything where that is above one year, you have to serve in a state correctional facility. Most of the women, uh, there's a women's state correctional facility out in Muncie. If you ask me to point out Muncie on a map of Pennsylvania, I could not do it, but I know it is in the western part of the state. Um, again, she was ordered to pay back the restitution. Uh, I think as of last, this number is as of last year, the 92000 has been paid back, still owing um, a large amount of money to these individuals. I would add, too, that we said from the beginning the first appearance of Ms. Swain was that of a nice uh, elderly lady. Um, I would say that she was anything but. Uh, when we talked to her, she was indignant. She was not remorseful. She wanted to insist that a lot of the payments specifically from uh, the doctor were gifts because they were lifelong friends. And uh, so she did not make the investigation any easier. Um, she's just not a pleasure to work with and, and not a very nice human being. And again, this is somebody who worked her way into a nursing home uh, where many of you work, uh, was able to, I guess she said uh, to you, Eric, that maybe she was this, this lady's only friend or, um, what, what were her words? It, that was it. She had nobody else. There were no children. There were no uh, close friends. She had outlived a lot of um, her other associates. So she was already isolated by the time Mrs. Swain uh, came into her life, or at least nearing that point. And then she was the perfect victim. Okay. 
And, um, and I'm sure many of you have, um, at your locations, have accountants uh, that you know that are working with a lot of the individuals or lawyers that are working with a lot of individuals. So this is just something to be aware of, to keep an eye out for, and, um, and again, to be aware of. So, all right, last one. This is Patricia Westerman. Uh, Patricia was the uh, was the neighbor in this case to the elderly individual. This is another, uh, I think Detective Clark from Ben Salem also had this case as well. Uh, again, good job, Steve. Um, this occurred in Ben Salem Township in 2017. You have the next one. So the victim in this case was uh, 91 years old. Um, his wife had passed away in 2015 uh, and he gave Ms. Westerman the power of attorney. He didn't have anybody else and um, he had a hearing loss and he had trouble communicating with banks so he couldn't do it on his own. Um, and, and so therefore he gives Ms. Westerman the power of attorney. This individual starts receiving past due notices for uh, credit cards he had and credit cards he didn't know he had. So the ones he had, she wasn't paying the bills and then he was getting more bills for credit cards that she signed up for. This is uh, wish.com. He was getting um, bills for nail salons, insurance when she didn't have, hotels at the shore, Comcast, restaurant bills, and cash advances, which he was not doing. So in December of 2015, he, um, he obtains a reverse mortgage to help cover his uh, expenses. And a reverse mortgage is essentially, you have a bunch of equity in your house, you need some money to, um, to kind of live out your um, as living expenses, and then you borrow against the equity of your house, um, and you can kind of spend that money as you will, and then upon your death or the sale of the house, then you gotta, you gotta pay that money back, which they usually do from the sale of the house. So, um, so he got that on his own because he needed the money. When he got that reverse mortgage, it goes into his account. Ms. Westerman takes seventy-five thousand five hundred dollars of it, so all but you know five thousand dollars of it. In December of 2016, he receives notice of an additional reverse mortgage of sixty-four thousand nine hundred dollars, which he did not apply for. Um, and the records, as as Detective Clark got them, showed that Ms. Westerman took and then transferred that money into her account as well. So now he had two reverse mortgages uh, against his house for a large amount of money and he had none of it. I don't know if you can see that on your screen. Um, so this is kind of like the timeline that we had put together for, for the prosecution of this case. In 2015, uh, she became the power of attorney. At that point, there was about $5,500 in a savings account. Um, and he cashes out an IRA for about $28,000. Defendant, as soon as that money is in the bank account between May of 16 and, 2015, uh, and June 15th of 2015, the defendant withdraws basically all that money from his account and then deposits it into her own Wells Fargo account. Uh, she writes a check into her own account. At that point is when the, defendant, or the victim's wife passes away. She obtains power of attorney. When she passes away, of course, there's a life insurance policy that he has. Um, she steals that as well and deposits that into her own funds and her own checking account. The defendant cashes out uh, a life insurance policy and then, and then deposits the funds into his account. Again, she withdraws his account. So any money that she can get her hands on, she's taking. The, she takes out the reverse mortgage. She takes the deceased wife's insurance policy. He cashes out his insurance policy. She's opening up credit cards. Um, she's paying her Capital One credit card uh, with it. Um, and it's sickening when you think about she's it. She's her own house. While he's reverse mortgaged twice on his, she's buying her own. Correct. So, and so she takes that money to puts it and puts a down payment on on her house as well. So just just robbing him blind basically and he has no one he has no one else to look out for him i mean he's he's old his wife has died he's grieving um he doesn't have 
any family around other than this neighbor who he had known for years. And um, he's not paying attention to what's going on. And he th he's thinking that she is taking care of him. And with that, she just continues to, uh, to rob him blind. So this kind of just gives the overall view of what, what we're talking about. So the total theft amount from his Wells Fargo checking account was about $152,000. Um, and there was another savings account, which was $63,000 for a total of $215,000 of theft from this individual. And that, that included the, um, the reverse mortgages that she, uh, she took and then deposited originally into his account and then moved. Any idea what the sentence was? I would, again, hope state time, but unless the, the suspect showed up with copious amounts of restitution. Well, she did not, and she was sentenced to 11 and a half to 23 months in the Bucks County Correctional Facility with another uh, 48 months of probation. All right, so again, some of the challenges that we see in these prosecutions, a lot of times by the time we're able to prosecute them, or the time we figure it out, we have deceased victims. Um, we have victims with dementia or failing health. Do we really want them testifying in court at a preliminary hearing or a trial? Do they want to testify? Um, the defendants may be the victim's only caregiver, like uh, like Miss Westerman was, or the only friend, like Miss Swain was. Um, so at that point, we may be dealing with an uncooperative victim, where the defendant and his family um, is the beneficiary of the will. In Ms. Um, Irvin or Ms. Ferreira's case, um, was going to get the money anyway. Um, also, these prosecutions do take some time. I mean, we want to try to stop the theft once we see it. But the problem is to do the proper investigation. Detective Landamia and the other detectives investigating it have to obtain certified bank records from all the accounts. Um, and it generally takes about nine months from a case to go from prosecution to the trial stage, where there's either a guy finding a guilt um, or a plea. Also, uh, a lot of these are, are involved, and some of them may require a forensic accounting, which are not cheap. Like, do you know how much how much they're charging? I know for recently accounting? there was a municipality which had its bookkeeper, which we prosecuted. Uh, stealing from them and their forensic accountant fee, which I don't even believe was completed yet, uh, was over $100,000. But I've seen others for personal or smaller business setups where they $30,000 is an easy bill to accumulate um, just to do a financial accounting or forensic accounting of, of the projected loss. I know myself, I believe uh, Detective Clark and a lot of the other detectives that have worked on these cases we've seen today do it themselves. So... One of, the, one of the things we talked about is trying to get restitution for these victims. So how do we do that and how long does it usually take? So one of the ways we can do that is we can seize assets. So if you're working in a care facility and you see something and um, you got to be careful about who you confront and when you confront it. Because if you confront somebody who, um, who is stealing from these individuals and you alert them that you're aware of what's going on, what are they going to do? Uh, move the money. Yeah, stop stop what they're doing, hopefully, and move the money that they stolen. So if they don't move the money or we can find the money, um, we have the ability to seize the stolen assets and kind of freeze them until the court case works out. And therefore, if we're able to obtain a conviction or a plea, then we're able to forfeit those funds into to and give them back to the victim or their estate. We've been successful on... Um, a number of occasions in doing that. I don't know if we've had any dealing with uh, the utterly, but on financial crimes, we, we have been able to seize stolen assets and then forfeit them at the time of place. So that's one of the things you want to be thinking about uh, if you ever come across one of these situations. Who do I alert? When do I alert them? I think the best thing to do is, is talk to the police department. Um, and you're, it, basically, you would be reporting it to the jurisdiction that covers uh, where your facility or where the victim resides. All right, so 
even in the event that um, restitution is ordered, um, sometimes if there's fraud, the bank will reimburse the individuals about uh, for the fraud. Um, I know there, the Pennsylvania has the Crime Victims Compensation Fund, which unfortunately I don't think helps us with financial crimes. I think it's more about um, physical crimes and obtaining restitution for uh, medical bills or injuries that are associated with it. So unfortunately, we, there's not like a pool of, of state money that we can draw from to reimburse our older, um, older residents. Generally, they'll have the length of a uh, parole or probationary term to pay the money back. Um, some of these amounts, though, I mean, we're talking two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. Um, I mean, you could you could pay a large amount every month, and we're still not going to get all that money. Um, if the defendants show an inability to pay that money back, meaning that they're not working and that their income's too low, um, their probation can actually close out, and the case just goes to collections and the only remedy that we have for obtaining any of this money back is filing to have them held in contempt. So um, again, our goal is, is to hold these people accountable, hold the defendants accountable, and try to get this money back or, or get some sort of substantial chunk back. But unfortunately, it's not, you know, not always the case. All right. Again, where to report, uh, it'd be the local jurisdiction of where the victim lives or um, or um, either the facility or where they're living in their home. Um, sometimes we'll have cases involving multiple jurisdictions. Um, and basically, we, want, we don't want to have to have the uh, older adult travel. So if the, the defendant is taking money in, from a location in Berks County and the defendant is living in Middletown, we'd like to be able to prosecute that case out of Middletown because if the older adult ever had to testify in court, we would want them going to the district court in Middletown or the, the common police court in Doylestown as opposed to courts in Berks County. The Area Agency on Aging is another place where you can report um, crimes to, and then generally if they if they see something, uh, they will then bring it to our attention. And again, also you can report to the district attorney's office as well as the Bucks County detectives. There's somebody basically on call 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, you can reach us by phone during, uh, during normal business hours and, and somebody will be there to, uh, to take your, um, take your allegations. There's also a, a crime watch tip on the county website and I believe on the district attorney's office website and there should also be a link to it on the DA's office Facebook page if you wanted to submit a tip either anonymously or with by giving your information for further contact, uh, you could submit a tip electronically that way. All right, I think we have about four minutes left. I just wanna see if there's any questions. I don't know if we got any, uh, Karen, if you had any. Um, One question not, in the chat right now. Yeah, there is a question on chat uh, from Mike. It says, I have seen an increase in the amount of romance scam, money mule scams, and victims being told to use Bitcoin. So how do you handle Bitcoin cases? Um, so many of the Bitcoin ATMs are popping up to make these types of scams easier. Do you have resources or advice about these kinds of cases? Right now, when it comes to Bitcoins, uh, a lot of the investigations hit that proverbial brick wall because there's there's no way, at least not that we've found, to identify uh, the end users in these Bitcoin transactions. Everything is done with some level of anonymization, so uh, it's really difficult to track anything. Um, right now, what we try to do is just catalog occurrences and uh, if need be, forward them to the ic3.gov website, uh, which is run by uh, the FBI in order to at least hope they can build some type of, of pattern or database and, and find some way in to further investigate these crimes. But from a local end, uh, once we start dealing in Bitcoin, unfortunately, it's been the end of the investigation. Yeah, and for these romance scams, I do agree with you. I have seen an uptick in them. And you know whether they're using Bitcoin or not, even if they're using regular bank accounts, it's still very difficult to locate the individuals on the other end of you know, that bank transaction. So 
So whether they're using Bitcoin or not, um, you know, they're 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 spoofing numbers. They're using fraudulent information to obtain bank accounts. They're using you know um, VPN addresses to hide their IP address on their computers. So th there has been an in increase, um, and we are right now just at a, as a as a loss as anybody else about not necessarily identifying them, but then holding the the perpetrators accountable. Yeah, at this point, the best way to combat these romance scams because of all of the electronic barriers would be education and prevention as opposed to uh, detection and prosecution. If we can get it stopped before it starts, it's, that's got to be the best way when it comes to these types of scams right now. All right. Okay, I don't see any other questions out there. Um, and Mike says thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Karen, thank you for uh, for for hosting this, and uh, I hope you all you. enjoy lunch and are safe out there. And hopefully, we'll get through this COVID nineteen uh, era uh, all together. <laughs>